Hey folks, it's Ray of DCRamRecord.com, and I figured I'd do a quick explainer as to what this video is. As you probably saw in the thumbnail there, it's like 50 some odd minutes long. It is not short. But essentially, this is the presentation that I've been giving uh, to the sports technology industry for the last decade. Uh, in the past, it's been in person an event with hundreds of people from around the sports technology industry. Basically, every company that I review is typically at this event. Uh, and I can pretty much talk about what went really well over the last year and what was a complete dumpster fire over last year. And there's no safe ground. Like it doesn't matter. Every single company uh, gets either roasted or not roasted. Whatever the opposite of roasted is like prize. They, they get credit if they've done something awesome. I talk about that and I talk about why it's awesome uh, and why both myself and consumers love that. And on the flip side, things that are hurting the industry or hurting consumers, I talk about that too. And hopefully change comes from that. Uh, and we've seen that over the last decade and I'm hoping that's the case going forward as well. And while this video is aimed at the industry, I've made it available on YouTube for you all to watch. Uh, so keep in mind it is focused on the industry, but I think everyone seems to enjoy kind of that peek behind the curtain as to how things actually work. Now finally, in the case of this year, it was held at the Garmin Developer Summit, uh, though that does not mean they get a pass, as you'll see on criticism. Uh, everyone, as I said, gets it. Uh, and so with that, I'll roll the intro that that they rolled before my presentation as it went live. Enjoy. Hey, I thought I'd find you two out here. Hey, Kelly, I meant to ask, what watch is that that you're wearing? The Phoenix Success Solar. Nice, and that one, Audra? The Descent MK2S. Cool. How many different watches does Garmin have? Currently, over 40. How do people decide which one they want? They do their research. They read blogs, online reviews. Makes sense. Who's one of the most influential Garmin product reviewers? DC Rainmaker. Where does he live? Amsterdam. How many Instagram followers does he have? 40,000. Nice. Facebook? 90,000. Guys, legit. What about Twitter? 67.7 thousand. Tell me one more impressive credential about him. Well, Runner's World said he's one of the 50 most influential people in running. When do we get to find out more about him? Right now. Rainmaker, DC Rainmaker himself, is our keynote speaker to talk about sports and fitness technology. Come join us. But pay attention, he talks fast. Okay, I'll see you guys inside. Thank you for that intro and the reminder to try and talk a little bit slower. No promises. We got a lot of stuff to pack in this. And of course, I am Raymaker of DCRaymaker.com, as noted there. Uh, but this is the 11th year doing this. It's kind of crazy. Like 11 years of sports tech year in reviews, uh, starting way back at the Ampla Symposium, uh, and then into the in-person Garmin Developer Conference a couple years ago, and now the past two years online and virtual. So I don't get to like, see anyone around this room. There's no one here, just, just me solo. Uh, kind of like it always is. But still, we've got tons of cool sports tech over the past year. Uh, despite being kind of a weird year in terms of product releases and all that kind of stuff, there's been a lot packed into this. And so I'm going to dive into all that, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, if you've been around this block enough, you know that I don't like hold any favorites when it comes to this presentation. Everyone's gonna get a little bit of love and probably a little bit of whatever not love is. It's not hate, it's it's constructive criticism. Uh, so everyone's gonna get all that, that's just the way. Now, if you're watching this live, then you probably know a bit about me and a bit about the site uh, and kind of the history behind it. Uh, but for everyone else that may be new around here, uh, essentially this started off in 2007 as a personal blog. So we're talking like 14 years now of sports technology stuff. I primarily started off with like race reports and Ironman journey and all that kind of stuff. and then eventually Eventually got into focusing on the products themselves. Still though, today I tie in a lot of what goes on in my day-to-day -day life into the site. Because uh, I think it's important to show that it's not just about like a pure race GPS or a pure uh, heart rate sensor, it's about how it fits into the rest of your life. So that's all kind of pulled into there. Uh, you can see the stats on the screen right now in terms of number of views and all that stuff. Uh, the main thing I kind of want to mention though is that I don't take money from any of the companies I review in this segment at all or talk about. Uh, it's just not the way I roll. So those companies are allowed to advertise in the site. They're not allowed to send me money or anything like that. Even this very presentation I'm doing for free. There's no like fee involved here or anything along those lines. It's just me talking to a camera by myself and then uploading it and hoping you find it interesting or useful. Ultimately, my revenue stream comes from people uh, using the links off the site, whether that's advertising links for all sorts of other random things, uh, or it could be a link to Amazon or a partner, um, or it could be watching this video on YouTube later on. All those things do help support the site. Now, in terms of the readers, it's a bit of a misconception that's all like hardcore endurance folks. Uh, the vast majority of views on the site 
are not for that. They're for uh, more basic kind of fitness trackers and activity trackers. Uh, and it's for readers all the way from the people doing the first 5K all the way up to Olympians. Uh, and it's all of the kind of sports media out there tends to follow the site, uh, both mainstream media that may be uh, coming from, you know, like a CNN or BBC or something of that realm, New York Times, et cetera, uh, that want to understand how a device works and then redo their own reporting based on that. So it's a huge audience. I try to distill all this super tech down to something that's relatively easy to understand but I'm still going to go super deep and geeky and stuff where it makes sense and where it's kind of interesting. So what is sports tech? Uh, in a nutshell, it's everything on the screen there. If it has got a some sort of microchip in it or some sort of processor and you're going to use it in sports, health, and fitness, then I'm likely going to cover it. So with that, let's dive into the sports tech trends of 2021. At a very, very, very high level, uh, kind of the core things that I saw over the past year were one, that companies focus mostly on software updates and feature updates and things like that uh, to older devices than necessarily rolling out brand new devices. And a lot of that was because of the fact that companies couldn't roll out brand new devices. They simply did not have uh, the resources, physical resources, whether it be manufacturing or component availability to do some of that. Um, and also because some of those devices were delayed from the previous year. Uh, so instead we saw a lot of companies rolling out updates, which is cool. It's seeing older, not older users, but older devices get updates that I think three and four years ago that wouldn't have happened. Uh, now on the downside, we saw standards by bodies like stagnating and losing their reach. I'm going to dive into this a lot later on, but uh, those bodies that decide what the standards are that makes this entire sports tech universe work hasn't been a good year for that at all. Uh, now, we've also seen kind of this continued push into like both medical and semi-medical scenarios. So things like ECG and SpO2 being more on the medical-ish side. Uh, same with continuous glucose monitoring on the medical-ish side. And then we have other things like body composition, as you see there within Samsung's latest wearable. Uh, and that whole realm of stuff that kind of falls maybe one tier below that. So like breathing rate and uh, respiration rate, which I guess the same breathing rate, but anything in that realm uh, that is sort of not quite certified as a medical device in most cases on these wearables, uh, but is something that's used to sort of figure out what you're doing in life. And so we'll talk about that a little later as well. Uh, and then, of course, I think we see a huge focus on sleep data over the past year. Not the sleep data itself, but leveraging that sleep data. Every single player in this space has been doing something with sleep data, uh, whether it's from, you know, basic respiration rate, to SpO2, to uh, snoring, all that stuff has been happening over the last while. Uh, and then in turn, companies are they're charging you for it. Uh, and we're seeing this push into recurring revenue more and more than we've seen ever in the past uh, from a lot of companies, but not every single company. That's something I'm gonna dive into more deeply as well. So this is, of course, a developer summit focused on primarily wearable developer platforms. And I'm going to talk about that a lot. But I think it's important to understand that the end state of coding, which you've been hearing all day long as part of this entire like developer summit, uh, that's all fine. You've, you've been geeking out on that for like six hours now or something at this point. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to the use case. Ultimately, that's what I'm going to focus on in this presentation. I'm not going to like talk about code for the most part. I'm going to talk about the end state use case of why all that code matters when it comes to actually giving an app or an experience or functionality along the way. And so that's what this, what this is about. Uh, and if we look at wearable platforms in particular, uh, going into 2022, there are really like three and a half platforms. Uh, you've got, of course, Apple's Watch OS. You've got Google's Wear OS. You've got Garmin's Connect IQ. You've got Fitbit OS, which I know you're like, wait a second, is it really a platform? And it's true. Like in this case, you know, Fitbit and Google have said Wear OS is the future. But at the same time, they also released the Charge 5 just a few weeks ago. Uh, and that device uses Fitbit's OS behind the scenes. In fact, you can go into the device and you can see uh, the apps there. And while you can't yet add third-party apps to it, it's the same interface, the same platform, the same apps uh, as it's been on their devices. So I, I wonder in the future, are we going to see apps at the band level where uh, Wear OS you know, just isn't scaling down to that small band level to be able to have the days of battery life that Fitbit will want. Still, as we look forward, I think one of the biggest changes in shift of momentum will be for Wear OS. Uh, not that you know Garmin or Apple's platforms are going down or anything like that. It's just simply that Wear OS is going from being like in a coma state uh, to almost dead. Uh, and now now actually rising from the ashes. And I know consumers don't necessarily like to hear that, you know, the phrasing that Wear OS was dead. But if you asked around the industry, that was the answer. The answer was, yes, no one's developing for Wear OS anymore until now, until 3.0. Uh, with Samsung jumping onto it uh, and Google showing renewed interest for it and other companies showing renewed interest for it going into 2022, uh, we're seeing developers jump on it as well. Uh, Strava is a great example of that, a company that more or less like abandoned their apps 
on Wear OS years ago, uh, rolled out a brand new, completely refreshed app uh, for Wear OS 3.0, and others are doing the same as well. Still, the most important decision facing developers is deciding on the correct platform to develop your app uh, and making sure that platform matches your user base. And then from there, making sure your app actually has a purpose. I know that kind of sounds silly, uh, but if you remember back to like four to six years ago, when the Apple Watch first came out, uh, Apple rewarded developers in terms of App Store featuring uh, if they went ahead and had an Apple Watch app for their uh, iOS app. Uh, in that case, what that led to is basically all these apps having just simply notification apps. Like they just duplicate and notify, duplicate. They duplicate and duplicate. Like all the duplicate words you can think of, that's all they did. They just took notifications and stuck it on your watch and said, this is an app. And that, that wasn't really an app. And uh, thankfully, we've gotten a Away from that uh, in a lot of different ways. But I think the good news is now we're seeing apps that have a purpose. They should be filling a gap. And within that, an app should target the correct user base. Uh, so for example, there's a Garmin Vario Radar app I'm going to talk about in just a moment here. Uh, in that case, it doesn't really make sense to probably target something like Google's Wear OS because the bulk of those users are not going to be on Google's Wear OS. Uh, well, you could technically connect to a Vario Radar using Bluetooth Smart uh, from that platform. Uh, it doesn't really make the most sense. Similarly, if we look at things like a Stride and Forms app uh, that are for both Apple Watch and Garmin Connect IQ, that makes sense because they have users on both of those platforms, and those are the core platforms. Whereas there are probably less users for both of those devices, both the Stride device and the Form Swim Goggle that you see there, uh, that are on uh, Samsung's platform because Samsung doesn't tend to do a great job of open water swimming. Uh, and historically, you haven't seen a lot of kind of more focused or more uh, hardcore runners on Samsung watches. Now, again, I think that's gonna change going into 2022 as we see more companies that maybe like a Suunto taking something like the Suunto 7 and porting it to Wear OS 3 and having a device that can compete there. In that case, it does make sense for those companies uh, to reinvest or to relook at Wear OS going forward. And I think that's something that will change this entire landscape, uh, which kind of gets me kind of like the last fun little category of apps that we're gonna talk about, uh, which is the air gap filling double display apps. And you're like, what on earth is that? Uh, and there's no better way to show this or explain this than continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, so this is something that, uh, you know, CGM has been talked about for uh, more than a decade. I went back and looked at my notes uh, from 2010 at the AMP Plus Symposium, uh, where they talked about it and they showed Dexcom's uh, CGM solution and pairing it to a watch way back then, 10 years ago. And it's just finally, today getting to that point. Today, Garmin, of course, announced earlier this morning uh, this connectivity between their Garmin watches and uh, the G6 there. Uh, and it's something that is literally a decade in the making. It's kind of crazy to think about. And of course, Garmin is not the first one that Dexcom's had a partnership with. Uh, they've got the Apple Watch connectivity that's been there for a while now. Uh, though in that case, that was more about like daily trends versus this, as you can see there, uh, is also about kind of during sports trends. So the exact values during sports is opposed to just sort of your daily view of things. Uh, and of course, they're not the only ones. I've been using lately the uh, Super Sapiens uh, sensor, which is essentially just an Abbott Lab sensor to do the same thing. Uh, but all of these have one sort of big catch. They all require a phone. Even Garmin's announced it this morning. Uh, you, need, you see that picture there, it shows the G6 with the watches, but what's missing from that picture is it still has to go to the phone, just like Super Sapiens does as well. In the, in the case of Super Sapiens, if you wanna go from that sensor to a Garmin device, your phone has to be there, or you have to have this handy dandy little band, which is another wearable that you've got to wear because things are all kind of locked in. Uh, now, at some point, this will change, of course, but it doesn't sound like it's a near-term thing. And this isn't like a regulatory thing, best I can tell from talking to various companies. Uh, this isn't some sort of technical thing. It's more around a business kind of interest thing uh, in the way they set up these platforms. And so I think that's something that has to change if we want to have this data uh, with us all the time without having our phone with us all the time. Uh, for cyclists, it's no big deal to have your phone in your back pocket most of the time. But for runners, especially people that are doing uh, longer runs, a lot of them aren't wearing phones with them, uh, aren't bringing phones with them. Uh, and especially Especially as we go forward with more and more watches having cellular connectivity with them, there's even less of a reason for many runners to bring a phone with them. Uh, so that's something that I'm excited about the announcements today and excited about what platforms are doing with continuous glucose monitoring, both from a medical standpoint, but also from a sports perspective. Uh, though I think that entire kind of industry is a little bit early on the sports side and how to leverage that. Uh, I've been using it again for a while and kind of understanding that all is something that's going to be very, very complex for the 
average user to understand in graphs, sort of like aero sensors in that same kind of realm, uh, and then getting that in a sports scenario uh, forward into something that's a little more manageable, a little more understandable, is something I think will probably take a few more years still. Okay, so now we're gonna shift topics just slightly to connecting all these dots together. Uh, and it's interesting here. This is something that uh, hasn't been reported on very much, but I think it's super fascinating. An amazing example of using sports technology all like from different parties, all in one thing for what I think is a common or greater good. Uh, so the South Yorkshire, Yorkshire, I hope I've got that right, uh, police department has been using a combination of GoPros, Varia Raider, a Connect IQ app, and then just like, real life people out on bikes on roads uh, trying to catch dangerous drivers. Uh, and again, this is something they've been working on for a while. They've been doing it previously without all these tech pieces combined. Uh, they start off with putting officers on the road uh, and then they put GoPro cameras on those officers and they had an officer on the bike uh, on the road and then up ahead of ways they had uh, motorcycle officers as well and they would basically, you know, radio and catch when drivers passed way too close or at way too high speed or, you know, did something uh, dangerous to a cyclist or uh, swore at them or yelled at them, whatever the case is, you can see this image right there of a cyclist uh, being flicked off from a passing vehicle uh, at high speed. And so in any of those scenarios, the cyclist with the GoPro, I was recording this entire time and the cyclist being a police officer. And then from there they'd radio head and the driver would get stopped and whatever would happen to them based on uh, the particular offense. Uh, but they've been stepping this up. So back in early September, they went out with a group of cyclists as part of a, a Trek women's group that they went out and they rode for like hours. So we're not talking like a 20 minute stretch down the road, but for hours uh, with the uh, their police folks uh, in front of them ways uh, and basically picking off drivers. And then more recently they went out with another rider. In this case, uh, she had the Garmin Varia Raider on the back. You can see that there, uh, but also on her Garmin Edge device, uh, she had a Garmin Radar app, a Connect IQ app made by a third party developer and not to buy Garmin at all, that records all that data. It literally records every single time a car passes you, uh, the estimated speed, overtake speed, uh, whether it's a dangerous overtake speed or not, uh, and it plots it on the map. It's, it's super fascinating stuff. Uh, and the police noted that of the 110 overtakes from the particular ride, 20 of them, 20 of them, so just about 20% or so, were stopped for overtakes, uh, high dangerous overtakes, uh, which is which is incredible. They say the police officer said the quote, which is disappointing, which is a very uh, nice way of phrasing it. Uh, but they had to stop 20% of the drivers uh, to talk to them about dangerous practices. Uh, but yet, as fascinating as this, this is incredible, like what they're doing there, and it's amazing. Uh, but there is so much opportunity here. Uh, there's so much potential opportunity to really ramp this up. Uh, for example, in talking to them, uh, they wish they had ways to have this data automatically overlaid on the GoPro footage they have. And uh, I know in the past, you know, Garmin used to be a competitor with with GoPro in terms of action cameras. But I think we can all agree, like if you don't lease a product for whatever it is, three or four years now or more or something like that, you're probably not a competitor anymore. So I would love to see that integration happen there. Uh, and the same thing goes on taking that integration and bring it into something like Strava Maps. Uh, and I think that's where there's so much potential for this sort of stuff. Uh, and when I go out and cycle, I wanna know where I'm not gonna die. And I think that's something that, you know, I'm lucky living here in the Netherlands that uh, arguably have the safest cycling roads on earth. Uh, and it's amazing. And I don't ever think about that. Uh, yet next weekend, I'm going to the US. And when I'm there, I'm probably not gonna ride my bike outdoors. Uh, not because I don't feel safe in all the area I'm going to, because I don't know where to feel safe on that particular road in that particular area. It's an area that isn't necessarily well known for outdoor riding, uh, and instead generally more known for vehicles. And so I'd love to be able to know where to ride in that area safely. And if I look at Stravis heat maps today, that's an example right there of uh, Stravis heat maps you'll see that those are all about telling me uh, either where I've ridden in the past, if the personal heat maps, or they're about telling me where other people ride. Uh, and even they can kind of figure out what the best routes based on uh, how many people ride those routes and the speed of those routes, because they're looking saying, hey, if this person's going fast on this route, then it's probably a good route versus a stop and go through a city or something like that. Uh, but the key thing is they don't tell me why that person's riding fast, which is interesting, because if I'm on a sketchy road somewhere uh, from a car perspective and I'm riding along, I'm hauling butt. I'm going as fast as I can to get through that little short section, hopefully, uh, and get to the next road. So that's almost like a, an inverted reason why you'd want to ride in that road. I don't want to ride in that road because it's fast. I want to ride somewhere else, but I have to get through that section fast. But I sit here and go, 
why is this data not there? Varia Radar has been out there for years now. Why isn't Garmin and Wahoo and Stages and Hammerhead, all of which support Varia Radar, taking the same sort of data, that little Connect IQ app that I mentioned made by a small developer in the spare time, why isn't that data being written to the FIT file and then in turn being passed to Strava? Uh, we're talking potentially millions and millions of uh, cycling rides every year that could be dumped into Strava in their gigantic database of routing uh, to figure out where the safest place to ride. We're to look at that data and go, this particular road has tons of car passes uh, at high speeds, at significant overtake speeds, at dangerous speeds, probably should avoid these things. And then further, if you go beyond that, why can't Strava look at that route that it just gave me and say, hey, by the way, 12 people died in this route over the last five years. And I know that sounds morbid, but isn't that the point of a routing engine to give me good suggestions? Uh, not just like the most scenic suggestions, but the ones that I, I know this road is dangerous. And I know for a lot of people, again, like people living here in the Netherlands, you look at this and go, this is kind of crazy. But one only has to look at the news in the last few weeks to find out what the heck rolling coal is and things like that to say, you know what? Cycling is more dangerous. How can these companies in this space make it safer for me? And of course, the reason why they can't probably do this most easily today is standards. Uh, and that's because standards groups over the last year, two years, have been kind of losing their ways. And standards are not exciting for consumers. or something that uh, I probably couldn't make a good YouTube video on standards because people would be bored about it. But ultimately, they are so critical to your products working the way you expect them to. Uh, they're critical to ensuring that they all work together and they work as expected. Uh, and we aren't seeing really meaningful direction from Ant Plus or Bluetooth Smart anymore uh, in terms of the sports sector. Uh, and there was a time period, like five years ago, where that was like, gangbusters. It was great. There was, of course, the annual conference, and there was all these meetings on the side, and some of those meetings certainly still occur. Those standards bodies meet, but there isn't really any momentum forward. And we see the results of that. We see the aero sensors have basically stalled out. There was a working group there. There's at one point talks about a working group around running power. Uh, all those things they've stopped. And as a result, companies have started to make their own working groups. Uh, for example, Notia and Velocomp uh, came together and published a standard earlier this past year around the aero sensor, basically saying, we've given up waiting for AMP plus aero sensors. Uh, here's ours, go ahead and use it. Uh, and of course that has its purpose, but everyone agrees that's not what they want. Uh, everyone agrees they would like to have a standard there, but can't seem to get it over the line. And of course, talking to all these groups, they all kind of blame each other in some way, shape or form. Consumers don't really care. That's, I mean, at the end of the day, they just don't care. They just want this stuff to work. Uh, and there's no better example of this than indoor cycling effect, because in this case, there are tons of consumer products that are coming out of the market. Uh, for example, Wahoo's Direct Connect, Gradient Simulators from Elite, and previously that, Wahoo uh, Climb. Uh, there is steering from all these companies, yet there is not a single standard for any of this stuff. It's just simply each company having to fight between them. Uh, and the thing is, if standards don't exist between the stuff, users are being held hostage. We saw this, a great example of this over the past year and a half or so from Zwift. Zwift effectively held users hostage uh, via these hardware manufacturers and demanded licensing fees to integrate with Zwift uh, versus they can't really do that for an AMP Plus trainer or a Bluetooth Smart trainer because they follow the standards. Uh, but when each of these things are baked in their own little ovens, then Zwift can do that and they have done that. And now to Zwift's credit over the last I would say four to six months, they've kind of like chilled a little bit on the demanding licensing fees for every little thing. But I don't necessarily think that's that's an assumption we have to go with going forward. I think these companies need to work together. Like I know they all compete, but at the same time, not really if they're if they're not you know competing against the right thing. So uh, I think there's needs to be more focus on that. Uh, and ironically, some of this is driven, of course, by lack of in-person meetings. Uh, there's been cases uh, somewhat recently, in fact, where I connected two companies that are well-known companies in this space and two people that should have known each other. And it's not like a knock on them, but it's a case of those people used to go to the AMP Plus conference every year. They used to go to Eurobike every year or Interbike every year or fill in the blank a conference every year. Uh, and they sort of forget that they knew each other at these other companies and may have moved around. Uh, and I think that is driving some of the lack of partnerships and lack of integrations across companies because people simply aren't meeting in real life. And they're not like stumbling into someone else and saying, hey, what about this idea if we did this? And I mean, that's like if, if you were at the Amplus Symposium for the decade or so there, that's literally what happened every single night is people from companies that used to compete would meet, have a beer, and come up with an idea to integrate together. Uh, and yes, they still competed at the end of the day after that particular uh, meeting, but they often had integrations between them, and that's that's unfortunately gone now. Uh, so. 
Shifting topics again a little bit, uh, going forward, I want to see dual all the things. I want to see dual frequency. Uh, we first saw this appear in a wearable this year by Chorus with the Vertex 2, uh, something that, you know, in theory allows for a far greater number of satellites, uh, in turn, far greater accuracy. Uh, and it's showing promise, but I wouldn't say it's like earth shattering at this point. In all my testing, it was mostly, yeah, kind of the same. Uh, there are a few scenarios where it was definitely better. A few scenarios in very specific cases around some rock cliffs and whatnot where it was clearly better. Um, but there's also scenarios where it was just as much of a dump fire as, dumpster fire as every other device I was testing. Uh, so it's something that, you know, I think there's huge promise in dual frequency and I would hope going into 2022 that any of the marquee sports watches are going to be using dual frequency GPS systems or dual frequency DNS uh, systems to go ahead and kind of increase accuracy going forward. Similarly, on the dual side of things is dual connection Bluetooth smart. Uh, this is something that really only Wahoo does today uh, across all their devices. Uh, and other companies are getting into it. Garmin does it on their heart rate straps and their uh, vector power meter, uh, rally power meter now, and then Polar does on some of the heart rate sensors. Uh, but it's super important for trainer companies because as more and more devices are Bluetooth only as opposed to AMP Plus and Bluetooth Smart, that means they're limited to one connection uh, and one connection on the sensor side. And of course that can be resolved relatively easily through dual Bluetooth connections. And again, those companies I just mentioned do that, uh, but it's becoming a factor. It's something that uh, just recently is testing the Polar Grid X Pro. I couldn't do the FTP test I wanted to do because my trainer that night only supported one Bluetooth smart connection, which was used up uh, by the training app I was doing. So the watch couldn't connect to it. Now, another area that's kind of increased uh, pretty interestingly in depth is both sleep tracking and sports metrics at, at whole. Uh, so it's something that over the course of 2020 and then in 2021, we saw sleep becoming more and more important to determining uh, the workout recommendations going forward. It's something that uh, Garmin and Polar kind of started to push uh, forward over the last year and a half. But I think we saw it really culminate in 2021 uh, with companies definitely looking at sleep and saying, hey, sleep has an impact on what we give you from a workout recommendation going forward. Uh, for example, we saw Whoop change their uh, algorithms this past summer on their Whoop band uh, to do that. We saw Coros introduce uh, Eva Lab, which uh, is a pretty good start as well onto things from them. It's not perfect. It's really right now focused mostly on the runner side and primarily flatland runners. Uh, but I think if you have to start somewhere, they threw down a very solid starting point for that. Uh, and then of course we fought, saw Fitbit as well uh, start to kind of tweak how they're gonna assign recommendations for uh, what you're doing that day based on how you slept that night, uh, which again goes back to the whole theory and whole kind of trend of having recommendations based on how much you're recovering, not just based on how much you're working out. Now, of course, with these recommendations come costs. And this is something that the continued rise of recurring fitness revenue. Uh, and if we look, we saw Apple Fitness Plus launch in the past year. Uh, and of course, since then, we've only seen minor updates from it, which is kind of surprising. I expected to see a greater kind of bounce out of that in 2021 after the launch in late, I think it was December of 2020. Uh, but we've also seen Peloton greatly expand their user base. Uh, again, all recurring revenue. Right here you see their uh, connected fitness subscriptions, which is crazy. They've doubled. They've gone from a little over a million, 1.1 million, to 2.4 million in the last 12 months, uh, which is absolutely insane. Uh, and then similarly, we saw their digital subscriptions uh, grow to nearly a million. Digital subscriptions, what they call their, basically their app users. So the first one connected fitness is people that own a Peloton bike or a Peloton treadmill. Uh, and they're predicting that will go to 3.6 million uh, a year from now, which does show a bit of a slowdown uh, in things, which, which makes sense. And we'll kind of dive back into like that whole indoor space slowdown in just a second. Uh, and Fitbit, of course, has memberships too. Uh, in their case, they haven't released numbers since the Google acquisition. Uh, but a year ago, they said they had 500,000 premium subscriptions. Uh, I would expect they have more than that now. But their approach is slightly different than I think a lot of other companies. Uh, they've sort of said, we're gonna give you uh, a lot of the recommendations pieces that other companies have. Uh, so for example, the upcoming uh, personalized recommendations for recovery and what you should do next is gonna be a premium only thing, regardless of which device you have. Uh, at the same time though, they've also pulled stats that are historically free. So for example, if you want more than seven days of data in a lot of the health metrics, you have to have a Fitbit premium subscription, which I think is kind of a dangerous game to play. Like I'm all down with paying extra for coaching and uh, classes and stuff like that. That makes a ton of sense, but I don't think you should be charging for your own data on a device that you've already paid for. To me, I'm, 
I'm not really a fan of that. Uh, and of course, there's tons of other recurring revenue fitness uh, platforms out there, uh, things like Strava and Whoop and Zwift and Train Road and a million others uh, in the indoor training space and even the outdoor training space uh, that have continued to grow what their user base is and grow kind of their mission, which is which I'm finding myself paying more and more for different platforms. And I think a lot of people are focusing more and more on subscription fatigue, and not just from the fitness space, of course, from everything. That's something that uh, you know people loud and clear are saying they appreciate the fact that if they buy a watch from Garmin and Polar and Suunto and Wahoo and Chorus and Apple, uh, that for all the main functionality, you don't need to pay anything extra. Uh, in the case of all those companies there, are only Apple has Apple Fitness Plus, but that is very distinctly separate. That is, again, as I said earlier, offering classes and things like that, that is not at all to do with your data. It's not to do with the things that you get on that watch. Everything on that watch is yours for free uh, because, of course, you already paid $600 for that watch or whatever it is that you paid depending on uh, the particular watch that you bought. Now, that then gets into probably the biggest mystery of sports tech in my mind, which is why these companies haven't gone after Whoop in that revenue. Um, you know, Whoop is charging 30 bucks a month uh, to use the Whoop band, and it's something that hasn't changed, and they've only grown in popularity. And we've got the, the new 4.0 edition uh, that should be dropping here pretty soon. It's already been announced, but uh, shipping hopefully soon as well. And a core feature of that is the increased accuracy. Uh, and of course, we'll have to see on that from a testing standpoint, but given how much they've focused on that in all the presentations, I'm hoping that's true. Uh, if you're a regular follower or of my stuff in the past, then you know uh, I found the 3.0 band highly inaccurate, uh, which is why it's so puzzling to me that companies, especially Garmin and uh, Polar, and then to a lesser extent Fitbit, that we'll get to that in just a second, uh, haven't gone after this market. They have all those pieces already there. In the case of both Garmin and Polar, they are well positioned with virtually every bit of the insights as Whip. In fact, way more insights than Whip, albeit like a little bit junkyard fashion, like they're all over the place in their respective apps compared to Whip's is far better at consolidating that information into one cohesive, actionable panel. Uh, but I just don't understand why either of those two companies haven't gone off this market because it seems so easy, uh, given they already have the hardware technology, they already have the software platform, it's just pulling that together in something cohesive. And I think Fitbit sees that. If you look at Fitbit's uh, upcoming readiness score, they are basically doing what Whoop does, but in their platform, and they're charging for it, but they're only charging a fraction of what Whoop plans to charge on a monthly basis, plus they're taking that uh, product revenue, that device revenue on top of that. Uh, but still, the one thing people forget about is Amazon. Of course, they just announced a whole slate of new uh, Halo kind of portfolio devices, and they've had the Halo tracker around for a while, uh, which is essentially a displayless tracker, and now the new ones have displays on them. Uh, and I don't think there's been a lot of attention paid to Halo, and mostly because it seemed like a bit of a disjointed experience when I tried it, uh, and most of the media has kind of been like, yeah, it's not so good. But if there's anything we know about Amazon, anything at all, it's that eventually they figure out. They figure it out. And once they do figure it out, watch out. And so that's something that I think it's really easy for everyone to forget about Amazon, but I wouldn't forget about Amazon. Eventually, they're going to figure this out, and big data and big platforms is something they do really, really, really well. Now, Shifting topics again, displays. This is something that I talked about last year a bit uh, and how there's such incredible demand for better displays. Uh, and of course, in the spectrum of watches, you basically have two camps. You've got uh, something that is like monochrome, very basic, and maybe in the, like eight bit color, not eight bit, eight color. Uh, and then you all the way up to like Apple Watch uh, clarity of display, right? And that's the whole range there. And of course, at the kind of lower end range of display, you usually get great battery life. And at the higher end range, you get like one day or less, 18 hours is Apple's official uh, battery life claim. Uh, but there's incredible demand for something in the middle. Uh, and I think we've seen both Fitbit and Garmin uh, kind of hit that middle ground of, you know, trying to give you like, four to seven-ish days of battery life, uh, plenty of GPS for the average person, and then having a display that looks really clear. This is the Venue 2 display that you see right there. Uh, and over the past you know, year, there hasn't really been a ton of movement in this area. Uh, we saw a lot of movement in 20, uh, 2019, and then a little bit more into 2020, uh, but I feel like 2021 was fairly quiet, and that could be for a lot of particular reasons, whether it be component or uh, you know product availability, manufacturing availability, stuff like that. But I think 2022 could be a really interesting year for this. Uh, first of all, we've got kind of the revamped Wear OS 3 watches, which are requiring a new hardware platform across the board. 
that's going to drive a lot of interest there from third-party partners, again, like the Suntos of the world that may be doing a revamp, uh, Sunto 7, uh, as well as perhaps Google's own watches down the road. And then two, for the endurance sports side, if we look at some of the stuff that was buried in all the announcements today uh, around Connect IQ, which of course is the main point of this particular developer conference, uh, there was changes to always on watch face only for venue two class devices. Uh, so there's essentially a new class carved out for uh, those devices with venue two being the only thing in that particular class uh, and how those devices and those always on watch faces uh, have more access going forward. And so if there's anything that's like a well-known in the TikTok world, not like TikTok the app, but like TikTok o'clock, uh, between how uh, Garmin does its Connect IQ platform and how they do the rest of their product releases, their actual watches and whatnot, is that they have always, since the beginning of Connect IQ time, since the very first day they announced Connect IQ, they've always announced platform changes first, and then they've announced the watches to take advantage of those platform changes. Uh, in this case, Garmin would not carve out a special section of high and display uh, devices in Connect IQ, uh, and then not deliver those down the road. I mean, that's that's kind of the point of doing this. Uh, and given the Venue 2 was just announced a mere like six months ago or something like that, uh, it's probably not going to be Venue 3 in, in just a few months. It's probably going to be uh, something else that can take advantage of that going into 2022. And that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing what comes of that. I think there's a lot of people, myself included, are hoping that we see uh, the more endurance-focused devices uh, with more endurance-focused capabilities, uh, but that have amazing displays on them. Uh, because for a lot of people, they don't really need to go out and run 80 hours or 100 hours on a device. They might need 20 to 30 hours of GPS time at most, uh, and then they want a nice device for you know charging once a week or one and a half times a week. So be interested to see what happens there uh, based on some of the announcements today. Now, kind of shifting a little bit as we go towards running in some of the other areas, uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting this year is how companies are using uh, premium materials to fill the gaps on features. And so, we, for example, we saw uh, Wahoo with the Wahoo Rival a little under a year ago now, uh, Koros and Polar all announced devices that uh, they just increased the materials capability on the device itself. So they went ahead and they added, uh, for example, uh, leather uh, with the Polar Guard X uh, or you know, nicer looking displays or uh, nicer bezel materials to essentially increase the revenue potential of that device uh, without necessarily adding more features. Uh, and it's something that I suspect we're going to see that trend continue. And not just because from a revenue standpoint, but because consumers want nicer devices. Uh, I used this Polar Grid X uh, last couple nights uh, going out to a super nice restaurant and it looked and fit the part, uh, which is something that you know you wouldn't have been on a say for a lot of other Polar watches in the past and a lot of other companies' watches as well. And of course, this is something that uh, we've seen with things and Garmin increment on as well in the last 12 months. Uh, meanwhile, Samsung and Apple didn't really change too much in this realm. They've offered more bands, some more customization. And of course, Apple already has their super high-end uh, lineup as well, but nothing really changed in that particular realm uh, going into the next year. So diving more into the running side of it, uh, there's been a lot of interesting running stuff over the last year, one of them being uh, snapping of all sorts. So in the case of Wahoo, they introduced race snapping, the idea that uh, you can go ahead and as you pass a mile marker during a race, like a physical thing on the side of the road that says this is mile number five or kilometer number five, uh, that you would tap the lap button on your watch and it snaps the distance in your pace to that. Uh, this is great for uh, cases where GPS might not be super accurate, or just when you want to be sure that if you're about to uh, hit those PRs that you are pacing precisely on uh, what you think you are, as opposed to some inaccurate, inaccurate data from your particular watch. And then Suto did something kind of similar before them, which is they snapped your GPS uh, data to the route that you defined. Uh, so this is super useful for big city marathons primarily, where you can load that route up, you know you're gonna run that route, otherwise you'd be off the marathon route or something. Uh, and it's gonna snap your GPS route for what you upload to sites like Strava, et cetera, uh, to the original route itself. And these are things that you know are somewhat race focused as opposed to being kind of wider audience, but I think they're pretty interesting. Uh, we also saw a continued option of running track mode, uh, something that Koros pioneered, Garmin joined them, and then Wahoo joined them as well uh, over the past year. I've gotta believe like if I'm in the running watch realm and you don't have running track mode, 
that to me seems strange in 2021, especially into 2022. Like it's just, it's becoming a core feature of a running watch to be able to go to running track and get accurate distance, accurate pacing, accurate uh, tracks on that, GPS tracks that is. Uh, so we'll see what happens next year. Uh, in terms of battery life, we saw huge kind of battery life gains in the endurance sports realm. First from Garmin with their Enduro, and then Coros countered that with their Vertex 2. Uh, you can see a screenshot here of real world testing. Uh, you know, a Garmin Enduro showing uh, 83 hours uh, estimated battery life as I went through this particular workout uh, using the optical heart rate sensor, using GPS, using all the features, like nothing's cut down on this, uh, which is super impressive. It's something that, you know, we wouldn't have even imagined just a couple of years ago. And now uh, we're seeing both Garmin and Coros push that further and further. Now, when it comes to displays, Watches are not the only one that want brilliancy. Uh, we saw a, kind of a really big shift in uh, colorfulness in 2021 on the cycling side as well. Uh, so for example, we saw the Wahoo Bolt V2 add color to it. Uh, they previously had it on their own, but now they have it in the smaller uh, Bolt 2. Uh, Sigma added color to their uh, displays as well. And then Hammerhead, you see in the lower right-hand corner there, they looked at Garmin, they looked at uh, the Wahoo Bolt, and they said, for our climbing page, we want every color, all the colors. They looked at that chart and said, yes, I want every single color offered to us uh, for the new climber page. And it's really, really cool. Uh, now that's got some quibbles on accuracy and stuff, but in terms of like display, I use this a bunch this summer uh, and it was awesome from a climbing standpoint. Uh, I think, you know, one of the best experiences overall in terms of using color in a display, not just for the sake of color, but to actually explain the amount of pain I'm about to incur uh, as before I get to it, I guess, or as I incur it or coming up. Either way, it showed me my pain before I got it and I found that pretty interesting. Uh, however, probably my favorite cycling related thing of 2021 was air tags, uh, which is something that wasn't made for bikes. Uh, in fact, we first saw Apple tease this way back in April uh, using their Find My feature to third parties. In that case, one of their first partners, one of the three launch partners was Van Move Bikes and allowed you uh, to have the Find My capability built into the frame of the bike itself. So if your bike went missing, you could still find it. And of course, then we saw air tags announced in April or May or whatever it was, uh, and that allowed you to take the small coin cell thing and stick it wherever you want. And of course, that concept isn't new. Tiles had that for years and there's been other smart things as well. Uh, but AirTags made it ubiquitous and took the entire platform of literally two billion devices uh, and made it so it's almost impossible to have something go away. And for me, I've already had numerous cases of this being useful, both in life, uh, missing suitcases for four or five days, uh, but also my bike. Uh, we had a cargo bike, we went on a trip and cargo bike wasn't there when we got back. It was taken. Uh, and having air tags on that bike so I could track that down and recover that bike was huge. And it's a story I'm still going to post about at some point. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, and it's something that uh, I have like for 30 bucks or wherever those things cost, 25 bucks in a four pack, uh, the best $25 investment I've ever made in my life, not just for the cycling side, but in life. And that's something I want to see that tech though, adopted into the bike. So just like Van Moof has done, I feel like if you're making a bike in 2022, a high-end bike especially, that should be built in. Like no questions should just be built in across the board. And I get that not everyone's iOS. I totally understand that. And I don't have a solution for that. Uh, I think that's a case where again, standards between these sort of fine type networks, uh, whether it be AirTags or something on Samsung or something on Tile or fill in the blank company, uh, some sort of interoperability would be good for consumers. Though I don't expect that to happen, unfortunately. So shifting topics again, aero sensors and running power. Uh, two topics that, haven't really gone too far. Uh, so aero companies are still kind of like swirling around. I'll say around the drain, because that, that implies they're all going downhill. They're just swirling in general, like an eddy on the side of a river, not going anywhere. Uh, and there are cases of companies, new ones popping up, popping up. So like uh, uh, Ghibli here, I think it is, or Ghibli, um, uh, popping up a Canadian company, met with them at Eurobike uh, on their aero sensor. Uh, and then there's other ones that just quietly disappear off in the sunset. Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, number one is just lack of demand uh, due to lack of races. Uh, people aren't racing, then having an aero sensor 
it doesn't make a ton of sense uh, for most people. Again, there's some people that are out there to get like their PR on something, but uh, if you're not racing, then spending all this money and training on something uh, to get the last second or two of performance isn't really a, doesn't make a lot of sense for all people. Uh, but then number two, the standards I mentioned earlier, the lack of standards I think is slowing this market down. And number three, the complexity of these devices. Every single company I've talked to has said we way underestimated how difficult making these devices are and how difficult making those devices understandable to end consumers consumers uh, is as well. Uh, meanwhile, running power, running power uh, is something that it's still kind of stagnating. Uh, you know, Stride has done everything they could possibly do to make this interesting for people, uh, but it's just tough. Now, we did get a bit of a boost uh, lately. Uh, Strava out of support for running power, uh, pulling that from the various device files uh, into Strava, so it makes it a little more visible than it used to be. That happened about a month ago now, uh, so that's a nice little bump there. Uh, but I think ultimately, as I said for years now, running power won't gain momentum in the masses until Garmin adopts it natively. And so until they do something like what Coros has done and Polar has done, uh, it's not going to hit mass market as something interesting. I know there's plenty of running power products out there, uh, but that does not mean that the average person, if you walk up to a race, understands running power. Uh, the average cyclist these days, if you walk up to a cycling race or cycling event, knows what a power meter is uh, and knows what to do with it. I'm not talking like just a, a random, you know, cyclist commuting, but I'm talking like any sort of race, a cyclist knows to do that. If you asked a runner any sort of running race now, it's going to take a few runners to find someone that knows what to do about that and knows how to use it and whether or not they even have the right devices to do that. So uh, it isn't about Garmin doing it better. Uh, I don't know if they will or won't do it better, but it's just about having that market share to drive this particular interest forward. Uh, meanwhile, on the cycling side, uh, the power meter slumber party of 2019 to 2020 has woken up. Uh, and so for 2021, we saw a, I'll say a ton of new products. We saw a bunch of new products uh, and mostly focused on expanding cleat types. Uh, so for example, we saw Garmin's rally power meter, the Garmin threesome, if you will, of SPD, SPDSL, and look, uh, pedal meals, pedal power meters pedal, but I can't stand that very fast. Uh, so all that stuff all in one spindle. So you just swap the pedals around. Super great for consumers. We saw Wahoo uh, introduce, though not quite yet deliver, uh, the speed play power meter. Uh, so the idea that they, of course, bought speed play about a year ago now, and then bringing that into uh, the market as a power meter. Uh, we saw Favero take Shimano's SPDSL pedal and offer that as well as, I say ish, because uh, they, you don't ship it directly as a power meter. You have to buy the pedal separately and then the power and stick them together and it's a bit cumbersome but it's an option for people that really want that it's an option there and options is always a good thing now shifting towards indoors uh the indoor cycling scene of course uh you know in the preceding year it was like blockbusters are the greatest thing ever uh, for indoor cycling because of the fact that everyone was forced indoors to ride a bicycle. Uh, and so as a result, we saw these huge peaks happen for all these platforms and a lot of those platforms had to deal with those peaks. Uh, but now it's, it's back to reality and it's back to focusing on the future and focusing on product development. Uh, and we're seeing different companies approach that in different ways. Uh, so for example, Wahoo just rebranded Sufferpest, uh, Sufferpest, Sufferfest as a system. And then I think we have a big pipeline for them for 2022 and adopting features into that that make it more like a training platform, similar to what uh, TrainerRoad has done with their uh, platform being more than just uh, doing a workout, but also the analytics side as well. And of course, TrainerRoad themselves has continue to tweak their adaptive training that they announced earlier this year, still like in an open beta state, still figuring it out. Now, of course, there were no major new smart bikes or even for that matter, trainers for the most part in 2021. There's a handful of things from a handful of companies, but for the most part, it was a quiet year there. I think that kind of sets the stage for 2022 being a pretty strong year, uh, mostly on the smart bike side. I think it's an area where companies will look to offer more realistically priced smart bikes. Uh, we see that with Peloton already kind of getting ahead of that and dropping their uh, bike prices pretty substantially, uh, not due to lack of immediate demand, but trying to get ahead of that curve down the road. You know, as we go into 2022 and more people are able to train outdoors and not restricted to a very small area around their house, uh, there's some people that will be leaving platforms behind. So by offering lower price platforms, trying to lock in people ahead of time makes a ton of sense. On that same indoor cycling realm, we saw cycling esports kind of become a bit of like an adolescent. Uh, it's growing up. And of course, there was a ton of interest in that, uh, you know, a year ago as everyone was forced indoors and the top tier pros were racing indoors and stuff like that. And then reality hit. And then as races started going back outdoors again, 
none of those top tier pros are participating in uh, online Zwift races or anything like that uh, for the past number of months. And of course, that's because the season is still ongoing. It's still got more time left. Uh, and now maybe after that, we'll see some of those teams pop in from a marketing standpoint. But I think it's really kind of solidified that there will ultimately be two different groups of people. There will be the pros that ride outside uh, doing those events that ride outside that you know the names of. And then there'll be the pros that uh, ride indoors and they specialize in that. It's a specialty just like any other sport. It's not necessarily uh, the exact same portion of the discipline as the people outdoors, and that's all right. I think, though, with that, though, uh, we need to see esports grow up a bit. Uh, and for example, the UCI is getting involved in a lot of things, and in a good way, like adding structure, adding rules, adding that kind of stuff. Uh, but a good example of this is the Zwift Performance Verification Board. It basically acts as like a doping agency, if you will. And don't get me wrong, Zwift is doing good work here in terms of having to make something out of nothing, having to address cheating. Like, that's I don't have any problems with what they've done in terms of uh, creating something from nothing and putting a bunch of rules in place and backing it up by science and tons of data. They've done some cool stuff. But ultimately, that sort of thing should not be held in the hands of a private company. It should be at the UCI level. It should be somewhere else outside of that uh, so that it is not just necessarily a given cyclist versus Zwift uh, for the future of their career and their reputation. There are people here, both men and women, uh, primarily younger, uh, that have basically had their reputations ruined by Zwift. And of course, they were responsible for that. They had their actions, uh, drove that entire chain of reaction things that occurred, but they didn't really have any true appeals process as part of that, uh, that you would expect from a sports governing body. And that's why I think it's really important to have this moved from uh, a private entity into some sort of sports governing body uh, that is not necessarily run by by a given company. Okay, so rounding home here on the last couple of things, uh, routing. This is an area that uh, has really expanded in 2021 uh, as people went outside and explored areas they didn't previously, um, often by themselves and explored new routes. And so we saw a bunch of companies introduce things in this area. Uh, for example, Sunto deepened uh, their connections with Kamut. Uh, we saw Polar expanding route capabilities recently with the GridX Pro and the Vantage V2. Uh, today's plan has added some pretty interesting thing in the new communities feature uh, where coaches can now put Push routes to entire teams, uh, which sounds like something you would expect would have existed already, but didn't. Uh, and that will actually pu push it directly to the devices. So for example, if you're on a Garmin device, my, it'll push the route to your device for that particular group ride, that particular team ride, uh, which is super cool. It's all like what you think technology should be doing. A coach or a team leader prescribes that, and then boom, you show up for that Saturday morning ride, and it's already on your device. Like That should be baseline, but it's it's new. It's it's awesome. Um, and then we have Coros that's promised their upcoming Strava routes integration that should be happening pretty soon as well. Uh, again, all about bringing routing platforms and mapping platforms and pushing them directly to our device. And that's something that I think is super useful. We shouldn't have it to recreate these routes on our devices every single time. We should create them in one central repository and push them to whatever device that we have on whatever platform we have. Now, as I promised at the beginning, uh, it's not just watches and bike computers. Uh, I do action cameras and drones too. We saw some cool movement here as well. Uh, so for example, GoPro added a full API for the cameras. This is cool for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it's cool for geeks and stuff like that. Um, and yes, this is the second time they've done something like this. But I think this time we're going to see some legit partners with it. Um, hearing that already happening kind of behind the scenes. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Uh, looking forward to seeing what these companies start doing as they integrate together. Uh, we saw Insta360 integrate with Chorus on action camera control there. Uh, DJI, from the drone standpoint, as well as their other products, has long had APIs at various different levels. Uh, and now we're seeing those even expanded too. And then Skydio on the drone side also expanding out their APIs more and more, uh, mostly on the commercial side, and that's also true for DJI. Though those work as well for the consumer side, both the apps as well as the flight data behind the scenes. And so again, the importance of APIs here uh, in everything. It's not just watches and you know linking data back and forth. It's also action cameras and some of the potential that could happen based on that uh, is pretty interesting and pretty exciting for me. So. What are the challenges and the opportunities for the industry ahead into 2022? Uh, I think number one, finding the way to get those standards groups back together, actually meeting, actually making decisions again. And I know that they've been meeting in like small pockets, but not making decisions and not moving technology forward. Uh, there's been zero announcements from a sports and fitness technology standpoint over the last year uh, around device profiles or new features and capabilities in device profiles that multiple companies can use. And as I've illustrated over the last 
however long this presentation at this point. Um, there are so many opportunities to do that for the betterment of not just the users, but also the betterment of the industry uh, and simply selling products, which is what most people, most companies uh, that are watching this presentation uh, from an industry standpoint ultimately want to do. And when you have those integrations, consumers will reward you for it. Uh, we've seen this time and time and time again that consumers will overwhelmingly uh, in the fitness and endurance sports space, uh, in the health space at large, choose companies that integrate with other companies uh, because they know they're gonna use those integrations down the road. Uh, it doesn't have to be something super geeky and complex. It can be very simple things and consumers almost always choose that over a competitor that has built themselves an isolated little wall. Uh, and I think with that, consumers almost always choose companies that reward uh, all the devices with firmware updates and feature updates, like we've seen over the last year, year and a half, especially a re kind of focus on that. Uh, consumers remember that. They know and remember which companies are giving them features for their old devices and which ones are ignoring their old devices and just giving a brand new piece of hardware. And of course, as always, as I and all my presentations for the last decade, just make cool shit. When you make cool shit, it works out every single day time. Without question, it always works out. If you make cool stuff, people want to buy cool stuff and they reward you for that. Okay, with that, thank you for watching. If you're watching this on the developer conference, then hopefully this was interesting from an industry perspective. And if you're watching on YouTube, then then whack the like button. That's, that's the way this works, right? The like button, subscribe button, the ding dong bell, the whole bit. That's the way this works. With that, thank you and have a good one.